uh, Hebrews chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles with you, if you'll turn with me over. Today we're going to look at verses 11 through 22 with a message I've entitled, Why the Melchizedekian Priesthood is Better. <clears throat> Back in the late 70s, um, I guess uh, Dollar Theaters, those of you who are old enough to remember those, by show of hands, how many of you remember the Dollar Theaters? Back in, okay. Uh, my brother and I used to love to go to the movies every Saturday, the Dollar Theater, back when we were in high school. I remember we went uh, one Saturday and uh, walked into the theater. It was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We were catching an afternoon showing of a movie. And uh, so my brother said, hey, I'm going to go in. I said, well, make sure you go down to the front part of the theater. We used to like to, back in those days, kids sit in the very front and look at the big screen. Uh, I said, I'm going to get something to drink and uh, use a restroom. I'll meet you down there. So I uh, went and stood in line, got my drink, uh, <clears throat> walked into the theater. Now, most of you probably have experienced this when it's real bright outside and you walk into a dark theater it takes a second for you to develop what they call in the military night vision, right? Everything's like really, really dark in there. And uh, I didn't know exactly where my brother was, but I knew that I had told him, go down to the very front. You know, generally that meant not the very first row, but sit somewhere, second, third, fourth row, somewhere in there. So I'm walking down and I'm kind of, you know, feeling my way, not making sure I don't fall over or trip over anything. And I come down, I get to the third row, and I sit down, and uh, I start drinking my Coke, and all of a sudden I said to my brother, I said, man, I said, I think we're, we're probably a little too close here. I, I don't mind sitting in the very front, but I don't want to walk out with a crick in my neck because we're looking up for the next two and a half hours. I said, uh, why don't we move back a little bit? And he said, no, nah, that's okay. I said, all right. I said, well, uh. Give me some of your popcorn. So I reached in, I started eating the popcorn, and then the movie was about to start. And I said, I, I'm telling you, I think these seats are really close. Why don't we move back? And I, I looked to my left, and it wasn't my brother who was <laughs> sitting next to me. It was a complete and total stranger. And unbeknownst to me, my brother was sitting directly behind me on the row. And I turned around to look, and he's laughing hysterically. <laughs> at my misfortune so I apologized to this guy and I got up and I moved back next to my brother I said why didn't you say anything he goes I thought you knew that guy after all you're eating his popcorn <laughs> some things we can be mistaken about and it doesn't really mean that much some things we can be mistaken about and it can cost us everything and, and that's the case that the writer to the Hebrews is, is warning to these Jewish Christians who are in very real danger of jettisoning the Christian life and returning back to Judaism. And he has been, over the last couple of cha chapters, begging and pleading with them, saying, don't make that mistake. Don't make that mistake. Again, for those of you who are visiting with us just a quick synopsis of where we've been for the last couple of chapters and the argument that we are seeing here in Hebrews chapter 7 it's something that began back in actually chapter 5 where the author begins to discuss this character in the Old Testament called Melchizedek who was both the priest and king of Salem but he realizes that he's not going to be able to go into this theological argument to teach the folks here who are in danger of apostasy. So he stops his argument and he begins to rebuke them because of their level of immaturity. He tells them that you've come to need milk and not solid food. Meaning at one point they were spiritually mature. I mean, after all, these folks had been Christians roughly for 30 years, right? Uh, the church was founded on May 24, 33 A.D. This book was written probably around 67 to 69 A.D. So they've been Christians for a long time, and they've regressed in their spiritual uh, 
growth and walk and knowledge. And so he tells them, I can't tell you really what I want to tell you because you're not going to get it. And so he warns them. He tells them, he says, look, folks, if you guys don't press on to spiritual maturity, you run the risk of facing God's temporal discipline, which could also include God confirming you in a state of spiritual senility because you refuse to press on to maturity. And then he tells them that, of course, beloved, we're convinced of better things concerning you. So he begins to encourage them again, saying, come on, folks, let's pick up. Let's pick up what we need to carry and keep moving forward. And so after he warns them, the author then returns to his main argument regarding the Melchizedekian priesthood and its superiority over the Mosaic law and the Levitical priesthood. And that's where we've been over the last couple of weeks here in chapter 7. Now, I've talked this over with some of you who've mentioned to me that this has been or has been in the past a very confusing chapter to really kind of grasp because of this mysterious figure, Melchizedek, who's really only mentioned two times here in the Old Testament and how he prefigures and how he figures into the author's uh, warning concerning uh, the superiority of Jesus and why these Jews need to keep hanging on and walking in their Christian faith and not reverting back and apostatizing to Judaism. And I've said, and we'll again reiterate for today, that what he's doing is he's arguing from typology. Typology. And so just to refresh you, a typology is a special example that we find in the Old Testament, which can be a symbol or a picture that God designates beforehand in the Bible and that he placed in history at an earlier point in time to point forward to something that would be a later fulfillment. And we said that there are many examples of this in the Bible. And in our current study of Hebrews, how Melchizedek fits into typology is this. Melchizedek, the Old Testament figure, is both a priest and king. Now, Moses, who writes the book of uh, Genesis, is the one who uh, puts that in the text. Uh, If we go back and look at uh, Genesis 14, where we're introduced to Melchizedek, that's where we find him, that he's both a priest and king, and that Jesus in the New Testament becomes the antitype or the fulfillment. So the author's point in laboring this argument is that Jesus is a king and priest, making him superior to any office or priest that we find in the law of Moses in the Old Testament, As such, here's the bottom line, the author tells his audience, you can't leave and go back to Judaism because Judaism has nothing to offer. That's the argument. That's where we are. And so the thing to remember about Melchizedek, particularly when you see the author say, you know, without father, without mother, without beginning, without ending, that he's not referring to, to the man Melchizedek. He's not making a reference to the the person Melchizedek. What becomes the typology or what becomes the part of the typology is, is the snapshot, that is the Polaroid, right, that the author presents based upon what Moses puts in Genesis 14. He took took a snapshot of Melchizedek in that description. Without genealogy, without father, with mo- without mother, remaining uh, perpetually both a king and priest. That's all that Moses presents to us in the book. He doesn't tell us anything about where Melchizedek the person came from. He doesn't tell us, tell us about anything in terms of Melchizedek, how he became king, and how he can be both a king and priest when under the Levitical law, kings and priests were something totally different. He doesn't labor that argument, he just throws it out there, presents the little Polaroid snapshot of it, and that is what becomes the type that's related to the anti-type or the fulfillment that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not the man Melchizedek, but rather how the man is presented in the text, that becomes what prefigures the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that's where we are in our argumentation. Why the Melchizedekian priesthood is better. Now, we're not going to be able to cover all of these today, but just to let you know where we're going to be going to finish up chapter 7, the Melchizedekian priesthood is better than the Levitical priesthood because it has a greater power, a greater permanence, greater promises, greater provision, and a greater priesthood. That's where we're going to be headed over the next uh, two weeks, that is this Sunday and next Sunday. So today we're going to look at three points out of these, which is the Melchizedekian priesthood is better because in verses 11 through 14, it offers a greater power. In verses 15 through 19, it has a greater permanence. And in verses 20 and 22, it offers greater promises. So let's begin by looking at verse 11. That is, that the Melchizedekian priesthood is greater than the Levitical priesthood because the Levitical priesthood could not perfect the saints. The Levitical priesthood could not perfect the saints of the Old Testament. Look at what the writer says in verse 11. Now, if perfection... Uh, now, here the word perfection comes from the Greek word uh, teleosis, which means to fulfill or to bring something to completion, to mature someone, to grow them up. He said, now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, and then he adds parenthetically, for on the basis of it, the people received the law, then he asked, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek? Now here he's making a reference to Jesus. And not be designated according to the order of Aaron. He's asking a very good question. He's saying, okay, we're going to talk about the priesthood. Now if the Levitical priesthood could bring someone to maturity, what then would be the purpose of another priesthood of arising which doesn't even come from Aaron? Every Jew in that audience would understood that under the Mosaic law, you have the high priest and then you have other priests that serve at the temple. And yet Jesus doesn't meet any of these requirements. Why? Because Jesus is not a Levite. Remember, the only people who could serve in the ministerial life of Israel were Levites. So much like the king of England and their royal lines, you get that job by birth, not by resume. Arnold Fruchtenbaum notes this. He said, if the readers had truly discovered and learned that Jesus had superseded the old priesthood, then they could see for themselves that the law had been done away with. The issue here is of bringing into perfection that which is in view, namely the maturity and the maturing process of his audience. He notes, God did not intend for perfection, that is completion, to come through the Levitical system. Well, then that begs the question. For example, many Jews viewed themselves as basically self-righteous according to the Mosaic law. Remember, God gave the law to the nation of Israel. Even Paul, the apostle in the New Testament, consider what he says about the law of Moses. Because over in the book of Philippians, he gives his pedigree, his credentials, if you will. He says, although I myself have confidence even in the flesh I if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh I far more meaning you think you've got a resume you think you've got a pedigree hold on let me pull mine out of my pocket let's compare that's what he's saying he says circumcised on the eighth day as all Jewish boys were of the nation of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin. Now remember, some Jews, after all the periods, you know, when people were born and in a lot of the synagogues in and around Jerusalem, records were made. However, there were some that fell through the cracks after 
the Babylonian and Assyrian captivities and so on. You had a lot of families coming around and eventually they just became secular Jews. They knew they were Jewish, but some of them probably didn't even know which tribe they were from. Paul knew. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Why? Because he can trace his lineage. As to the law, a Pharisee. No one got higher at the trough than him, the Pharisees that is. As to zeal, that is the practical application of Judaism, a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now, some of us will look at that and say, is Paul saying that he didn't sin? No. But what he is saying is that he did what the law required when he did sin. And on that basis, that is, keeping the rules, keeping the regulations, making the sacrifices, I, that is Paul, was saying, I was blameless. But notice, after he comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, reconciling all of that, he says, but whatever things were gained to me, according to his pedigree, according to his resume, those things I have counted as loss. For the sake of Christ. Now a lot of Jews were just like him in those days. Yes, I keep the law. Yes, you know, we all sin. We all stumble in many ways. But I would go make the certain sacrifices. I would make certain restitutions. And as such, I'm okay with God, so they would say. But notice what he says. If perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, what further need was there for another priest? Meaning, if that was good in the eyes of God and man, then why would there even need to be another priest in the priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? Why would they need another priesthood? Well, we did this about a month ago, but just to refresh you, consider both priesthoods. Under Aaron's priesthood, that is the Levitical priest, there were many of them. They served temporarily, meaning they would come up because you could only serve from 25 to 50 and then eventually those priests would die and another generation of priests would come up. They sacrificed daily. Blood was always running out of the tabernacle or the temple. They had to offer sacrifices for themselves. They offered animal sacrifices. They entered a man-made tabernacle or temple in comparison to what Jesus did. Jesus, our high priest, is the only high priest. His office is permanent, internal. Why? Because he has an indestructible life, an argument that the writer will bring up here in a moment. His sacrifice was once and for all, meaning that when he died, that is, he offered up himself as our penal substitute, that his blood, as pure as it was, removed the sin from those who would place their faith and trust in Him. It didn't have to be offered year after year. He offered up Himself. He entered into the heavens, and our righteousness is completed by His own blood. So why is this priesthood confusing for some Jews? Because the author is bringing up Okay, you folks have been associated with Aaron and the Levitical priesthood, but there's a superior priesthood that we're a part of, and you're wanting to jettison that and go back to the Levitical priesthood. But that's not possible. That confused a lot of people. It confused a lot of people before Jesus, and it even confuses some of the Jews today. Why? Because they've been so ingrained into thinking that the priesthood and the the Levitical uh, rites that are being practiced by the Levitical priest is the only way that Jews can function. One of the reasons why they rejected Jesus and one of the reasons why eventually they're going to try to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem have been preparing themselves, collecting even now red heifers from Alabama, to institute a sacrificial system again. Why? Why? 
because they could not get this one fact. And it wasn't a man telling them this. It was actually God Himself. It's recorded for us. We, we looked at this is the one verse last time. Uh, but I want us to look at the entire psalm. It's Psalm 110, verses 1 through 7. Now, just to set this up for you, what he's referring to here is a prophetic messianic psalm. I'm going to ask you a question right after I finish reading this, so I want you to pay attention. Here's what David writes. Yahweh said to my Lord, or in some of your translations it'll say, the Lord, in all uppercase, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies as a footstool under your feet. Now the reason this is somewhat confusing, Jesus himself even brought this up, speaking to the religious leaders of his day. Because how can the Lord be both David's son and David's Lord? That was something confusing for the religious leaders. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies as a footstool for your feet. Yahweh will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, have dominion in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely in the day of your power, in the splendor of holiness from the womb of the dawn. The dew of your youthfulness will be yours. Yahweh has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings in the day of His anger. He will render justice among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will crush the head that is over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, He will lift up His head. What's going on here? Here we have David writing a psalm where you have, and just to cut it down, you have God the Father speaking of God the Son, and again, this is something that's brought out in that Luke, uh, Lukean passage uh, where Jesus is correcting the Pharisees, but he's talking about a time here which occurs when. When does all of this come to fruition that we see here in this psalm? When is it that the Father promises the Son that He will crush kings in the day of His anger. He will render justice among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will crush the head that is over the whole wide earth. When does all of that come to fruition? In the millennial kingdom. Exactly right. As a matter of fact, you, you have John the Revelator even writing of the same thing in verse 11 of chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. He begins and he starts talking about the Lord coming down from heaven and His armies with Him. And Him ruling the nations with a rod of iron. So he's talking about a time in the future. And in the midst of giving this prophecy which again the Jews of the Old Testament wouldn't have or understand because they lack the progressive revelation that we possess. But he tells them, you are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. This is God the Father saying this of God the Son. Again, what he's saying and what will be revealed through God's progressive revelation is simply this is that Aaron and the Levitical priest was meant to be a temporary order. As such, they become the example or the type, which is ultimately fulfilled in the anti-type, and that is the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the order of Melchizedek, demonstrated and proven by Psalm 110, verse 4. All of that to simply state that the Melchizedekian priesthood has a greater power than the Arianic priesthood or the Levitical priesthood because the Levitical priesthood could not perfect the saints. In addition, the law, that is the Mosaic law, the Levitical law that governed the religious expression of worship in Israel, that could not perfect the saints either. And we see that in verse 12. For when the priesthood is changed, that is from Levitical to Melchizedekian priesthood, 
of necessity there takes place a change of law also. It's, it's very interesting because so many times, e even we churches today, aside from the argument that he's making in reference to making his plea before the Israelites, these Christian Jews, look, don't return back to Judaism because there's nothing there. Stay here. An application for this today would be for us. So many times, I can't tell you growing up how many times I would hear the argument, and just to use this, and we mentioned it a little bit last week. Now, I'm not by any stretch of the means saying that we should not be giving to the churches and so forth, but how many times as I was growing up in most churches, particularly Southern Baptist churches, that we would hear that we need to be giving a tithe because that's what God mandates in the Old Testament according to the Levitical law. And yet, and yet here, the author tells us where there is a change in priesthood, that is from the Arianic priesthood to the Melchizedekian priesthood, which is currently in effect right now, there has been a change of law. Again, Arnold Fruchtenbaum notes, he said, Since the Mosaic law did not perfect or bring any individual to spiritual maturity, the priesthood ministering under the law had to be done away with. Why? Because there was an inseparable connection between the Levitical priesthood and the Mosaic law. So all of those things, and I was just using tithing as an example. There's a lot of things that were associated uh, with that. But he's saying the Levitical law finds its origin based upon the Mosaic law. And the writer to the, um, uh, the, writer to the Hebrews is saying all of that has been replaced. So what then was the purpose of the Old Testament law? I'm glad you asked that question. Just to refresh your memories, the Mosaic Law was given only to Israel. It wasn't intended for all the nations of the earth. The Mosaic Law reveals the holiness of God, that is, His character. It reveals the sinfulness of man, but it didn't provide a means for salvation. The law was divided into the moral, civil, and ceremonial facets of the law, and it governed all of the life of Israel. It was instituted by a blood covenant, Exodus 24, 1 through 8. We won't look at that for the sake of time. We have covered it on numerous occasions in the past. But you'll recall, nation of Israel comes before Moses. Remember, he comes up, he gives the stipulations of the law. They make an animal sacrifice. He sprinkles blood on the covenant. He sprinkles, sprinkles blood on the people. The people say, all that you say, Moses, we will do, thereby binding themselves to this covenant, and God bound himself to this covenant as well. So it was instituted by blood covenant. And so God bound himself to dealing only with those associated with the covenant to the exclusion of everyone else. I want to say that again because a lot of times we don't catch that. God bound himself to the nation of Israel to the exclusion of everyone else. This is one of the arguments that Paul makes over in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2, for example, as he's writing to uh, the church at Ephesus, which included Jews and Gentiles in the church, but predominantly Gentiles, he says, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope. And without God in the world, that is the only way a person could have a relationship with God is that they had to become a proselyte to Judaism. But now Christ, Jesus, who you formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So MacArthur notes this in reference to the law. He says, the purpose of the law simply was this, to demonstrate that man in his total sinfulness, his inability to please God by his own works, and his need for mercy and grace, the law was added to show that the depth of man's transgressions against God. <clears throat> 
wicked was given to drive him to despair, to guilt and the awareness of his need for a deliverer. So, how was the law of Moses then replaced by the law of Christ? We get asked that question often, remember. If God bound himself to the nation of Israel, there back in the Old Testament, that was in force until the end of that covenant, which began on Friday, April the 3rd, 33 A.D. at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, when, remember, on Thursday night, Jesus took the cup and the wine and the bread, and he said, this is the new covenant which is given to you. And at that time, that covenant was ratified the very next day when he died. When he died upon the cross, his death ended the old covenant, that is the Mosaic covenant, while at the same time, his death ratified the new covenant, which was enacted at that very same moment. You say, how do we know that for sure? I'm glad you asked. Over in Matthew 27, Matthew says this, that at the moment Jesus died, that is, he says, beginning in verse 50 of 27, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit, meaning he died. And behold, the veil in the temple. Now, we're not talking about a shower curtain here, folks. This thing was huge. The veil in the temple was torn in two. Watch this. From top to bottom. Not from bottom to the top. But what he's saying is, if you could picture this imagery, that God is the one himself who tore the, the veil to the temple in half. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. Thereby this new covenant was instituted. So what does this mean for us? Rari notes this. He says, The Mosaic law was done away in its entirety as a code. It has been replaced by the law of Christ. The law of Christ contains some new commands, some old ones, and some revised commands that we find in the Old Covenant. With reference to capital punishment, for example. Specific Mosaic commands that are a part of the Christian code appear they're not as a continuation or part of the Mosaic Law, which is why sometimes people get confused, or in order to be observed in some deeper sense, but as specifically incorporated into the, that code. And as such, they are binding on believers today. For example, the Old Testament covenant code had 613 commands in it. There are over 1,000 commands in the New Testament. So don't think as a Christian, oh, we don't have to deal with the law anymore. We don't have any commands. We're all grace. We can be antinomian now. No, that's not what he's saying. That's not the intent. We have over, way over the 613 commands. We have over 1,000. A particular law that was part of the Mosaic Code is done away that same law, part of the law of Christ, is binding. And, by the way, that will be the law in which you and I will be judged. Remember what James says over in James chapter 2. So speak and act as those who will be judged by the law of liberty, the law of Christ. And then third, the Levitical priests were from a temporary order. Again, as we have just argued and labored. Look at verse 13 and 14. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, namely the tribe of Judah, from which no one is officiated at the altar. Why? Because only Levites could do it. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. So Jesus and his priesthood are in a class by themselves. He is our eternal high priest. Psalm 110.4, you, Jesus, are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So why is the Melchizedekian priesthood better than the Arianic priesthood? Because it offers a greater power, and secondly, because it offers a greater permanence, and we see that in verses 15 through 19. The Levitical priesthood and law were never meant to be eternally binding. Look at what he says. 
And this is clearer still, if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of the law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. Meaning, Jesus qualifies to be the priest not because he's a Levite, but because he exists perpetually, an indestructible life. For it is attested of him, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Three times now, the author has made reference to Jesus being of the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of the former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And So again, the question is begged, what is this better hope that the author is speaking of? Because the law was never meant to be a means of making man right before God. Rather, it was to demonstrate God's holiness, the sinfulness of man, and to drive man to the Lord Jesus Christ, which Paul so eloquently states in Philippians 3 when he says, More than that, I count all things as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish." Paul really hated his former life in terms of what he now had in Christ. We don't get this again in the English because the term has been sanitized. Rubbish. Skubalon is the word in the Greek and it is what we would use as a slang term for human waste. I'm not going to say what the word is, but if you've heard it before, that's what he's writing here in the Greek text what the Greeks would have understood as that's how Paul is now viewing his former life. That's how much Christ and grace has elevated him up now compared to what he once was to include his pedigree and to include his resume from his old life. Notice what he says, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. Why? Because it can't make you righteous. But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Hodges notes this. He says, The Levitical priesthood was superseded by the fact that our Lord descended from Judah. That tribe had no role in the Levitical institutions, and the things God had said about the new priest applied to one from Judah, which is proof that indeed a change in the law was made. That's your evidence. That's our evidence. The Melchizedekian priesthood offers a greater power, a greater permanence, and finally... In verse 20 and 22, a greater promise. That is that God promised that Christ's priesthood would be superior to the Levitical priesthood. Look at verse 20. And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they, that is the Levitical priest, indeed became priest without an oath. Why? Again, they were born into their jobs. But Jesus, with an oath, through the one who said to him, you say, well, what do you mean? What oath are they talking about? They're talking about the promise that the Father made and said about the Son that what? The Lord has sworn and will not change His mind. You are a priest forever. This is now the fourth time He's driven that home to us. Do you get the idea He's trying to tell us something? That Jesus Christ is superior, that He's better than anything we could hope to offer in terms of our righteousness before God. We have none. He has it all. As such, He is the guarantor of a new and better promise. The one who surety or guarantor of this covenant, that is our co-signer. Some of you may not really understand what surety is, what it means to be one who guarantees something. But uh, if you have kids, or maybe when you were someone who was young, you wanted to go establish a line of credit or what have you, and the companies would look at you and say, 
hmm, we can't take a chance on you. You will need to get someone to co-sign for you. That is, because you don't have the capacity in and of yourself to pay us back. We're not saying you can't do it, but as it's, we're looking at you right now, you don't seem to be able to go get a co-signer and we'll give you whatever you want. And so you do. You did. Because that company understood that while you couldn't pay us back, your co-signer could. Jesus is our co-signer. One who is the surety or guarantor of this covenant assumes the responsibility that the imposed obligations of the covenant will indeed be carried out. He will guarantee the fulfillment of the new covenant. And when will these promises be realized? Well, there are some promises that are being realized now, and there are some that are still future. In terms of the spiritual blessings that we have based on the new covenant right now, if you're believing and trusting in Christ this morning, your name has been written into the Lamb's book of life, you have the permanent indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, you are the recipient of the spiritual blessing of the new covenant promised in Jeremiah 31, 31. You've been given a new heart. Your heart of stone has been replaced with a heart of flesh. You now have the capacity to know God and enjoy God's life and experience fellowship with Him. So in that sense, the spiritual blessings of the new covenant can be obtained right now by anyone who believes, that is, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin and eternal life. But there are material blessings associated with the covenant as well. When will that be fulfilled? When the Lord returns and sets up His kingdom upon the earth, and He will rule and reign in righteousness for 1,000 years. Revelation 20 tells us, and we as the church will rule and reign with Him. MacArthur notes this, he said, While spiritual blessings of the new covenant are in effect for the church, the national and physical promises and in context of Israel, of the new covenant regarding Israel, will still need to be fulfilled. The Lord thus declared, Behold, the days are coming when Israel will receive the salvation promised in the new covenant, and this will occur when Jesus returns. So what should we take away from these verses? Simply this. One, that our perfection or completion is found in nothing other than belief or trust in Christ, who is the mediator and the guarantor of a new and better covenant secondly because the promises of life are based upon god's word and not our own works we can be sure that our eternal destinies are secure in christ now the question we have to ask ourselves is this the author is making an appeal to the people the jewish christians of his day and he's saying don't return to judaism don't return to that self-righteous work system because it has nothing to offer you. My question to you would be, for us, many of us did not come out of Judaism. Most of us, in fact, did not come out of Judaism. And so the question that would be applicable for us today is, is there anything in your life that you're trusting in to get you to heaven other than the Lord Jesus Christ? Because if that is, my friend, you're hanging on to something that cannot save you. Only belief, that is, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, can save you. What that means is this, and most of us, again, uh, who don't come out of a perhaps religion like Roman Catholicism or Buddhism, where those folks have been ingrained that certain systems and adherence to those systems, apart from any kind of faith, just do the works, that's what's going to make you a good person where the Scriptures tell us that the only thing that will do is send you to a place called hell. The only way, the only way that a person can be found righteous in the eyes of God is to have an alien righteousness imputed to them in their account. And we get that by faith and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. So are you doing that this morning? If not, then what prevents you from trusting in Him right now simply belief and trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins and you can have his righteousness and you can have his heaven
by believing and trusting in him. Edward Mote was a famous Baptist preacher back in the old days. And he used to love to write hymns, little poems, if you will. One of his friends had a wife who was passing away, and he was asked to come and to visit with her. And he had been working on a poem. And so as he said, well, you know, I'll go and visit with her and pray for her and pray with her. And as he was there, he just felt compelled to, to read this little poem to this lady as she lay dying. And today it's become one of the great hymns of the Christian church. He says this in the poem. Maybe you know it. He says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the, trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness veils His lovely face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. We talked about that just a couple of weeks ago. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. She said, you know what, you need to get that published. That sounds good. And that's exactly what he did, and that's what we have today. And the truth of it is this. Anything apart from the Lord Jesus Christ is sinking sand. Are you placing your faith in Him and standing on the rock? And does your anchor hold within His veil?